would like to thank the organizers for inviting me. I'm happy that this conference finally uh, is taking place. Uh, I spoke in this room last year, uh, about the same time of the year, but it was not a conference. Uh, so by various reasons, as many of you know, the conference was postponed and it's nice that it's taking place now. In fact, I'm, uh, I think some of my colleagues uh, have somewhat uh, distorted impression of what it takes to go to Kiev. I try to make my modest contribution to explain that it's very pleasant and nice, aside from being the right thing to do. Uh, but anyway, I'm happy that there is no audience here. Uh, my talk uh, will be more about a certain point of view and a certain program uh, than about specific results. There are specific results, and I hope the last uh, maybe 15 minutes uh, I will talk about this complete result. But I'd like to present a certain point of view which is natural, but nevertheless fairly new. And I hope it will be of interest both to experts and to people uh, who kind of look at the theory of dynamical systems from the outside. Before I proceed to the substance, I would like to uh, pay tribute to two outstanding mathematicians. Uh, Mita Ichanosov. who died almost at the same day uh, last August. Dmitry uh, uh, Vekoshanosov, of course, as many of you know, is one of the founders of the modern theory of dynamical systems. And, uh, his name Certainly, in my talk will appear many times because uh, the talk about Anosov systems, Anosov men, diffeomorphisms, and so on, so, so, so forth. Uh, he had, as far as I understand, long and productive interaction with Ukrainian mathematicians uh, in Kiev in particular. Uh, and uh, Chernov uh, belongs to a different generation. Uh, he died, of course, well uh, before his time. He made outstanding contribution in, again, the area which I will touch, mostly the study of uh, billiards and uh, dynamical systems with singularities. Uh, in some sense, it was Chernov who took this kind of very fruitful but not very rigorous set of ideas put forward by Sinai Bonovich and made it into a rigorous modern theory. So I'd like to, uh, this is a great loss for our field, and I'd like to pay tribute to these traditions who, well, and also for me was a, uh, an older colleague of my like a teacher, uh, and Chernoff was a good friend. Okay, now to the substance. Uh, basically, when we talk about the handle systems, the distinctive features of the modern study of dynamical systems is to understand the asymptotic complexity of the orbit structure in deterministic systems, right? This is a, so you start from some system of equations or some difference equations, 
uh, often in sweet looking, and when time evolves, you observe more and more complex behavior. So the classical setting for the, this study is the following. You have a face space which is convenient to think of as a compact manifold, even though it does not necessarily exhaust all the possibilities. But let's talk about it. Then we have a, a, so I'm talking what called classical dynamical systems or conservative dynamical systems, which again does not cover all areas of uh, interest. Uh, for example, the study of attractors doesn't uh, fit into this. Uh, so you have a volume element. which is, of course, finite, since the manifold is not part. And then you have either a map or a flow vector field. So the flow is generated by the vector field. Uh, which produces, so you consider either the discrete time system, the iterate of the map, or the orbits of the of the school. And as I say, an assumption in this discussion is that the volume element is positive. So volume element is positive. Which simply means that if you take a nice set A and apply it, then uh, the volume of the set is the same as the volume of the set. I forgot to say that I assume that this is in the Okay, again, it's a certain instance. So this is what sometimes considered classical. Setting, and of course, the setting is motivated by, first of all, by classical mechanics, where you have uh, Hamiltonian flow, right? And Hamiltonian flow, due to the Liouville theorem, preserves the phase void, right? So that's a classical setting. It covers lots of other settings. Now, let me talk about asymptotic goals. Uh, so if you have a dynamical system, uh, I mean, the, the, the main point, the central point of what you're studying is, as I say, it's a mirror of complexity with time evolution. So how you can think of appearance of complexity? Well, you have more and more orbits. Of course, you have infinite many orbits to begin with. But suppose you want to distinguish, to distinguish orbits with a certain device, and if at each moment, so this is phi t of x, phi t of y, if for a while they stay close, you don't distinguish them. Okay. So you only distinguish them if at some point they go sufficiently far. In this case, of course, since it's a compact manifold, compact phase space, you only have finite limits and orbit segments for any t, and the goals of this number make sense. And this goals is what's called topological. So what you do, you fix epsilon. 
Sinn? And you consider C and epsilon uh, well, let me do this way. Let's uh, we'll introduce so-called Bohr metric dc of xy is a maximum distance between orbit centers. I'm doing it for continuous time, but you can think of t as being either continuous or discrete. Maximum t. Okay? So that gives you a metric which is of course equivalent to, to for any t to initial metric, but it produces some stretches. So then uh, then we do what in say capacity theory, dimension theory, people do, you look at how many different, uh, say, balls you need to cover the space in this metric. In other words, how many orbit segments do you need to approximate any orbit segment of length t with fixed precision? Okay? So what you do then, What you do so S C of uh, epsilon. I assume that the metric is fixed, but it doesn't depend on the metric, is the uh, uh, minimum number of epsilon balls in dt to cover this space. And then it's a simple exercise that if your system is differential, given by differential <coughs> equations, or by difference equations, then this new soup is always fine. It's always fine for any epsilon. And then you take limit as epsilon goes to zero. And this is what's called topological entropy of your flow. Okay? So it's a global complexity of the system. Uh, this has nothing to do with the volume element. Uh, with the volume element, you can associate a different notion called measure theoretic, or Kolmogorov, or sometimes Kolmogorov Sinai, or I would say Kolmogorov R Sinai. Setting because Arf discovered it independently of Kolmogorov. Arf is a mathematician from Odessa, who maybe some of you know. Uh, which uh, the original definition of Kolmogorov entropy looks very different from this. But I will say in the words why it's very similar. Uh, so, if instead of trying to cover the whole space, if instead of trying to cover the whole space, you cover all space except for set of measured delta, small fixed measure delta, volume delta. And do the same thing. 
and then let epsilon go to zero and delta go to zero. You get a quantity which is very similar and which turns out to be under certain assumptions, which I will not discuss under natural assumptions, uh, equivalent to the famous Kolmogorov So you have H2 and you have H, let's call it H4. And of course, from this definition, it's obvious that you have an inequality. This inequality is called variational principle. Well, to be more precise, you can do it You can do it not only for volume, but for any invariant measure. And the fact that this inequality takes place is called variational principle. Of course, the way I defined it, it's obvious, but uh, this is not a conventional definition. Okay. So you have these two global characteristics, the biological entropy and volume. Uh, and one tells you the goals of the number of all distinguishable orbits, and the other gives you uh, the goals of the number of statistically significant distinguishable orbits. Okay. Now, uh, I realize that I have limited time, so let me maybe for a moment not to talk about the Bonoff characteristic exponents, even though I hope I will introduce them later, but play with these two notions. Uh, so the very basic question in what I call the flexibility problem, problem is to ask other than this obvious in the world, what else can be said about these two quantities? That's, that, that's a general question. Uh, I will give you some specific examples. And uh, what's behind it is the following fact. Uh, in dynamical systems, as in many other areas of mathematics, we introduce nice quantities, nice invariants, and stuff. Well, but to introduce is one thing, and to be able to calculate is another. And those things are asymptotic invariants, and very often difficult to, to calculate. So, basically, the picture is like that. We don't see any particular rules, any particular reasons for the quantities which we are playing to be restricted in general. But we very often lack constructions to demonstrate. And this is the heart of the, this program, which I hope to give you some glimpse. Maybe, I don't know, maybe I will still uh, Okay, so here is an example. So suppose now M, maybe I should call it S. Or S and U. Compact surface. Any minus surface. There is difference between the even surface and the minus surface. 
Внимание surface is simply surface with the Imanian metric. Okay? Then uh, you have it's called them, the unit tangent bundle. And then what at each point, so that is your surface, at each point you take all the tangent vectors of length squares. It's a three-dimensional manifold. And on that menu, on that manifold, we have a very natural dynamical system it's called geodesic law. You take a unit tangent vector V, you draw the geodesic. with this initial condition. And you get a vector with a different uh, foot point, which is called uh, this, this flow of the dynamical system is called uh, geodesic. Of course, this construction works not only for surfaces, but I specifically uh, wanted to discuss it for surfaces. Okay. Now, so M is a three-dimensional manifold with a unit tangent bundle. This system is actually a Hamiltonian system. If you think of the cotangent vectors instead of tangent ones, you immediately get a Hamiltonian system. Or you can explicitly see that the phase volume is invariant, and the phase volume is product of the volume here and the angle measure. You can just make a simple calculation. So it's invariant. So we are in the setting of uh, which I discussed at the beginning. Now, uh, well, so of course, everybody knows classification of surfaces. Uh, they are orientable and non-orientable ones, and the orientable comes in three varieties. There is a sphere. There is a torus. And there are the surfaces of higher channels. So for the purposes of my talk, I assume that the genus of S is greater than 1, or equivalently, earlier characteristic is negative. So it's something like this. Okay. Then, of course, all of you had differential geometry course at the university, there is a notion of curvature. Right? The Gaussian curvature. And there is a famous gauss bonnet formula which tells you that uh, if you integrate curvature over the volume on the surface, we get 2 pi times area characteristics. In other words, if area characteristic is negative, then the average curvature is negative. can be negative ever. So there is a large class matrix for which it's negative. So I want to concentrate my attention now on the case when curvature is negative. In this case, the geodesic flow is a prime example of hyperbolic behavior or what is called a monster flow. Continuous time are kind of poster 
children form the hyperbolic networks. Understand they have a complicated global structure or global office structure, but this office structure is well understood. Okay? So I want to concentrate on a simple question. So you have your our metric. So let's go our metric sigma. And we assume that the curvature, of course, curvature depends on the metric. And I have two numbers. The biological entropy of the geodesic flow and the uh, volume entropy, which I will, by some reason, call each lambda. So those are two characteristics which I described mm -hmm. in general state. Okay. So for this quantity, we have some sort of form. When I say some sort, this is not a formula where you can kind of explicitly make calculations. But at least it gives the expression as an integral of some geometric forces. For this guy, there is no natural formula, and no natural local formula. So, there is an interesting observation that uh, uh, in this case, uh, it's not only this inequality, but this is an old factor, which I told in 1992. That in this particular case, not only you have this inequality, but you have something, some marking, which can be put in between. Namely, there is a number, I will write it down, Two pi times uh, area characteristics order volume uh, minus order one half. And this is simply the value of the curvature for the metric of the same volume of the square root of the curvature. For the metric of the same volume, of constant curvature. If you look at the gauss bonnet formula and assume that the quantity curvature is constant, you get this value for the square root of that. So, this is always greater than equal than each lambda if you fix the volume. And less or equal than each. Okay? So this is not very difficult, but I would say pretty not trivial result requires some uh, observations and looking at the problem from different point of view, asymptotic also volumes, creation of some relational arguments. It's it's not I mean it's not difficult technically, but uh, it's not a proof which one can find in a straightforward fashion. So, and more, if a quality, then curvature is false. So, this is an example of what's called a genius. information about finitely many uh, numbers, finitely many invariants, give you a statement about the geometric structure. Because, of course, surface of constant curvature is a very particular kind of beast. It will appear in Svetlana's talk, but it's an object of 
extensive studies in several areas of mathematics. And then the question, what if you So I just want to illustrate, since I have very little time left, uh, let me try to illustrate the state of the art. So we fix the area of the surface, and we ask, we have two numbers which have to satisfy this and Can we find the metric of negative curvature for which one number is topological entropy and the other number is metric. So first of all, how we would look if we put H top here and H uh, here, then this is the critical value. So one of them has to be bigger, and the other has to be smaller. So that's a potential area where we can So uh, the result so far which we have this migrating uh, uh, student at the Yerchenka. That this is indeed possible. That you can get any point here and find the measure with topological entropy, for which the pair of topological and metric entropies have this one. Well, you may ask so much. Well, the answer is that the constructions we need to use are global. As I say, there are no ways to explicitly calculate this sort of point. I think I have to finish it. Uh, there is no way to calculate. So basically, what, you, what, you, what, what we are doing is the following. We are saying, OK, we want to be able to carve arbitrary close to the bottom and arbitrary close to the right. And then, 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 then here somehow stay and then somehow deform and cut it. So the argument, even though construction or the parametric family of constructions is reasonably explicit, not so easily. In one version of our proof, we have to use famous H of which as of course everybody knows the pin in the same form. Uh, that then you can cover the whole area. Mm. So I think I should stop because you know, I used up my time and this is uh, what? You have to finish at 55. 55? Oh, 55. Yeah, it's 55. 55, okay. Ah, so, well, that's, that's then let me quickly say a uh, couple of things. First of all, how these constructions can be achieved. Uh, maybe for people who know a little bit about uh, conformal structures and Riemannian geometry, what they say would be more surprising than for the analysis. Because this formula can be improved. This formula can be improved. 
Uh, there is a fundamental theorem in the theory of Riemann surfaces, which tells you that every metric on the surface is conformally equivalent to a unique metric of constant curvature of the same volume. So in other words, if you have a metric sigma, it can be written as some function uh, r, which is a scalar function, times sigma naught, where sigma naught has constant curvature. This is so-called Kirby regularization theorem. It's a big brother of Riemann metric theory. Of course, everyone knows that. Even maybe even maybe theory. This is a kind of one step. So every metric can be this is just just a scalar function. Now, if you want to calculate the volume, obviously, uh, you know, if you take your metric and multiply by a scalar, you know, but half is the volume element. So you know that integral of r has to be 1 if you want the volume of this to be equal to the volume of this. Now, what is rho? Rho is the integral of square root of rho. Well, by the standard how it's called, Hölderian equality, whatever it is, this is always less or equal than 1. And it's equal to one only if it's one. So this is a stronger formula, and it tells you that not only the biological entropy jumps, but it jumps at least by this coefficient. Mm. Not only the measure kinetic entropy drops, but it drops here. So what it means that we are here. Or here, it means that rho has to be very close to one, which means that in L one, your function r should be almost constant. So your metric may be pretty bumpy, but it's a strange type of bumpiness. Something like that. So which tells you that if you want some sort of construction of that kind, uh, if you do it by conformal change, this conformal change is going to be quite exotic. So, we, that tells you why this problem is not true. On the other hand, uh, there is another way to control uh, the biological entropy, I say it in the words. Uh, you can take your surface S and take a universal cover. So the universal cover, of course, is a disk with a metric which is invariant under the fundamental rule. So if you look at the ball of radius, R on the fundamental or on the universal cover, it goes exponentially, that you learn in your non Euclidean geometry uh, course, if you had one. But it's also interesting that the exponent of this growth is exactly the topological entry. So the topological entry can be globally calculated in a purely geometric. So, for example, if two metrics are C0 close in the sense that uh, your geodesics kind of don't change very much, then you can guarantee that their entropies are close. So, in order to do the construction here, what we do is something which may be of certain interest for uh, uh, Someone interested in kind of elementary geometry. You take a, your surface of negative curvature and you do a polyhedral approximation. 
Most when he had approximation would be, first of all, not negative curvature, be flat in most places, and it also going to be singular a little bit. But then you smooth it up. And that's the way we do here. Uh, the way we go here is a little bit different, and I don't want to uh, now to get into the details. I just wanted to demonstrate that even such in innocently sounding problem leads in interesting questions in differential geometry. For example, we still don't know the answer to the following question. Suppose instead of taking all possible metrics of negative curvature, we fix conformal class. In other, in other words, we take all metrics of the form R times sigma naught, where sigma naught is fixed. Uh, in our construction, this part definitely requires going toward the boundary in the space of matrix of negative curvature in so-called technology or modular space. So this is still an open question, and when we ask geometers about some professional differential remaining geometers about the corresponding question, they seem not to know. So the, the moral is that when you start looking at the problem from a new angle, uh, you may kind of highlight uh, natural questions which experts uh, didn't look at. Uh, thank you for your attention. I think I only managed to tell you about entropies, but believe me, when Lebunov exponents come into the play, think, things become less comprehensible. Thank you. That's a, that's a 
driving force behind the thinking. Let us send the speaker again. Thank you very much.